Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are throughout the country. Uh, we're excited for our startup showcase today featuring uh, um, who's very knowledgeable in this area. And I'm great. I'm very excited to hear what she has to say today. So we'll just walk through our agenda really briefly. Um, I'm going to give a pretty brief introduction, just going over the themes for today and introducing our speaker. We have our keynote from Grace Michael, who's with Emissions Reductions Alberta. Um, and then we have our two innovator remarks. So we have Jerry Christian from New Life Green Tech, and we have Daniel Ronald from Infinite Carbon. Um, following that, we'll have our panel discussions. So we have a Q&A portion. If you do have questions at any time, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll collect them for that Q&A portion at the end. Um, and then we'll just finish with some quick closing remarks. As always, we like to acknowledge where we come to work and, and come to play on these lands. So with gratitude and respect, we acknowledge that the lands on which Foresight operates are the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Personally, I am in the land of the Ashinaabe and the Odinoshone under the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. If you feel so inclined, please drop your land acknowledgement in the chat. So a little bit about Foresight. We are Canada's largest clean tech innovation and adoption accelerator. We've worked with over 1,200 Canadian clean tech companies um, in our last 10 years of operations. We have a network of over 250 global clean tech EIRs and mentors. I think that number is closer to 300 now, actually. We have 400 private capital partners, 15,000 clean tech community members. We've um, we've curated over 25,000 climate connections since we've. Uh, been in operations, and we have 150 national impact partners. Our goal is to do more with less sustainably. And CarbonX wouldn't be CarbonX without our partner. So Carbon Management Canada is a leading specialist in advancing strategies and technologies for emissions storage, management, and reduction that shape Canada's low carbon landscape. They support the large-scale carbon management projects through innovation and applied research activities with a focus on monitoring carbon in the subsurface, the validation and integration of fugitive emissions, monitoring technologies, and the development of a skilled workforce through training, education, and outreach. And so Carbon Next, we are advancing CCUS technologies and Canadian competitive, competitiveness. With the largest pipeline of emerging carbon management solutions, Carbon Next provides support for ventures looking to commercialize and helps industries adopt business-friendly friendly technologies that reduce emissions. And so on the topic of today, what is BEX? Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BEX, refers to a suite of technologies that capture and permanently sequester CO2 from processes where biomass or other inputs are converted into fuels or directly burned to generate energy. And so we're gonna learn a lot more about that today. And so I'm your moderator, moderator. I am Shannon. I'm the program manager for Carbon Next here at Foresight Canada. And I'm gonna pass it over to our keynote, Grace Michael, the director for technology impact um, with em Emissions Adu Reductions Alberta. So ERA was created in 2009 to help deliver on the province's environmental and economic goals. ERA takes action on climate change and supports economic growth by investing in the pilot demonstration and deployment of clean technology solutions that reduce GHGs, lower costs, attract investment and create jobs in Alberta. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Grace. Thanks so much, Shannon. So um, like Shannon said, um, I'll be speaking about um, Bioengine with CCS or BEX. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my organization that I work for, ERA, um, and why we think this is a promising opportunity for emissions reduction, uh, not just in Alberta, but also in Canada. Go to the next one. Um, so a little bit about emissions reduction, Alberta, if you are not familiar with us. So ERA was stood up at the same time as Alberta introduced an industrial carbon tax about 15 years ago. It's actually our 15 year anniversary this year. Um, so um, basically how it works is heavy industry in Alberta um, has to meet um, steadily decreasing benchmarks for their emissions. Um, and if they miss those benchmarks, um, one option for them is to pay into a fund called the tier fund. Um, and a portion of that gets allocated to us each year. And what we do with that money is reinvest it in technology and innovation to reduce emissions. Um, so it gets recycled back to industry. Um, and we focus on projects that are near commercialization, so high technology readiness. Um, they have to reduce emissions, they have to create jobs, um, and then they also, um, they have to be innovative. And then we all of our dollars are matched with at least um, one dollar private sector. Usually we have even better leveraging than that, which I'll tell you about. But it just shows that there's industry pull for the for the innovation. Next one. Um, 
this slide just sums up our investment over the past 15 years. Um, so we do, I'll be talking about BEX today, but we do fund, um, we're industry agnostic, technology agnostic. So our projects span many, many different um, technologies from hydrogen to renewables, to nuclear, to um, you know, cement, to oil and gas. Um, and we've invested nearly a billion dollars um, across nearly 300 projects. Um, those projects have a total value of $8 billion. Um, so that's generated a significant economic activity over the years. Um, and then um, as is our mandate, our goal is to reduce emissions. So from the projects that we've invested in, um, we've um, we anticipate reduction of over 40 megatons by 2030. And that's just from the projects we anticipate um, greater reductions beyond that as those technologies get commercialized into the market. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about BEX as a carbon dioxide removal opportunity. Um, bef before I did that, I wanted to give a little bit of an intro to carbon dioxide removals in general. Um, so also known as CDRs. Um, so this is a broad family of technologies um, whose goal is to remove CO2 from the carbon cycle and durably um, store or sequester it um, underground or in products. Um, so it's permanently um, not contributing to uh, climate change and, and emissions. Um, and so it's another way to think about it is as a negative emission. Um, and the reason why CDRs are increasingly important is, um, you know, I don't have any kind of modeling or graphs in this, in this slide deck, but um, as we look at kind of emissions reduction trajectories, um, many sectors are not reducing emissions quickly enough to meet climate targets. And so there's a role for removals to help um, accelerate those emissions reduction, emissions reductions. Um, and offset emissions from sectors that maybe don't have a near-term pathway to, to reduce. Um, so that would include things like aviation, the tech sector is another one that's investing in this, um, and, and really any sector that can't reduce emissions quickly enough. Um, and that will, and the, the idea is that this will help get us on track for our climate targets. So you'll be hearing more and more about this in the, in the next few years, I think. Next slide. Um, so there's three different major pathways for CDRs. Um, I'm gonna focus on BEX today, but I wanted to kind of acknowledge the broader context and there's definitely more beyond this, but this is often how you'll hear it uh, divided up. So probably the most common type of CDR that you'll hear referenced is direct air capture. Um, it's very simple to understand. It's just simply removing CO2 from the air and sequestering it um, in some way, typically underground, but it could be in a product um, that permanently stores it. Um, and so direct air capture, um, just very straightforward, removing carbon directly from the carbon cycle. Um, one of the challenges with that is that um, CO2 in the air is, it's very dilute. So that means that to capture it out of the air takes a lot of energy. Um, and so that means that you need clean energy um, to do that. You need a lot of it. Um, and so if you don't have that, then you might be you know, adding to the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's one of the challenges with direct air capture, but um, DAC is something that's emerging as a CDR tool. Um, BEX, which we'll, I'll talk more about in the coming slides, but um, this looks at applying retrofit or conventional post-combustion carbon capture, or in some cases, pre-combustion carbon capture, um, to facilities that are combusting um, biogenic fuels, so fuels from organic materials like forestry or agriculture waste, um, and I'll explain why in a minute, but that basically allows you to be producing clean energy at the same time as achieving um, a net reduction or a carbon dioxide removal. Um, so there are some advantages to that. Um, the third area um, is broadly known as nature-based solutions. So again, this is a very broad term that refers to kind of adapting and changing um, the way nature already absorbs CO2. So it could be changes to forest management practices or agricultural practices, planting things that are better CO2 absorbers. Um, and so this is something that's also an emerging pathway. Um, one of the challenges with um, nature-based solutions is verifying how much of a um, removal has occurred compared to the baseline or compared to what would have happened anyway, and also verifying permanence. Um, but there's lots of different different um, different ways to go on there. So um, like I said, I'll talk about BEX here, but if you do have questions on either of these other pathways, I'm happy to address those as well. Um, next one. Um, so a little bit more about BEX. Um, so when you take um, something that's biogenic, um, so that is, you know, and it could be include something like forestry waste or agricultural waste, some types of organic waste, anything that's organic that the CO2 that's encapsulated in that originally came from the air. So it's already part of the carbon cycle. Um, so when you burn that, you release that CO2, but because it's already part of the carbon cycle, it's not considered a net new emission. It's different from 
fossil fuels where you're unlocking CO2 that's been locked up for millions of years and isn't part of the carbon cycle. So because when you do that, you end up with net, um, net neutral emissions, that means if you capture that CO2 um, and sequester it and remove it from the carbon cycle, it's actually considered a carbon removal or a negative emission. Um, and so one of the reasons why this is easier than, um, well, in some ways it is easier than direct air capture is because um, when you're burning a biogenic fuel, you'll typically have, um, you'll have a flue gas that kind of comes out of that combustion process that'll have somewhere between 10 and 20% CO2. And it's easier to capture that than it is directly from the air, which is very dilute stream, takes less energy. Um, and you're also producing a clean energy product at the same time. So that could potentially help your, help your business case. Um, so BEX is the only technology that produces clean energy at the same time as generating carbon dioxide removals. You can go to the next one. Um, so here's a few different examples of how BEX could work in industry. Um, so one of the most perhaps um, near-term uh, examples is at, um, at least in Canada, um, is at pulp mills. Um, so pulp mills, um, so for example, in Alberta, we have five pulp mills. Um, each of them um, already takes some forestry waste and burns it to produce electricity that's exported to our grid. Um, and if in the future they were to uh, retrofit CCS to those facilities, um, they could be generating carbon dioxide removals. Um, in Alberta, that's about a five megaton opportunity in total. Um, across Canada, it'd be, it'd be more significant than that. Um, so, and another thing pulp mills can look at is, for example, there's some things like slash piles and, and um, forestry, you know, things like branches that aren't used in forest pulp and paper products that are currently either left in the forest or burned as waste that could be diverted into producing more electricity and with carbon capture, producing more carbon dioxide removals. Um, another pathway that at least one company is exploring in the province of Alberta and elsewhere in Canada and US as well is um, biomass to hydrogen. Um, so this involves actually gasification of forestry waste um, to produce hydrogen and then they capture that CO2 to generate a removal. So in this case, instead of producing electricity and removals, they're producing hydrogen and removals. It's just another approach um, to producing, um, to resulting in removals, but also producing a valuable product. Um, and then another, another method that um, is currently being utilized in Europe, um, but that we're starting to see interest in Canada is uh, waste to energy. So around, depending on the waste stream, um, but municipal waste can be 60 to 70% organic. Uh, so that means if you take that waste and divert it from landfill, turn it to energy, and then you, um, then you add carbon capture on that facility, you're actually generating um, BEX based carbon dioxide removals at the same time as providing a pathway for your waste. Um, one more pathway that's not on this slide, but I'll mention is um, use of agricultural waste. Um, that one's a bit trickier because you kind of get into um, like food value chain, but there is a facility that's under construction in, um, in the Alberta industrial heartland um, to produce biodiesel from low value or waste parts of canola. Um, and so if they were to add carbon capture to that, that could also be another pathway. So basically anything that um, can best um, a different source of biogenic um, feedstock, and then you add carbon capture, you can generate carbon removals in this way. Next one. Um, so as I mentioned, CDRs in general are gaining traction worldwide and BEX in particular is also gaining traction as a, um, as a pathway towards carbon removal. Um, so this is just an example of a major transaction that herp happened um, between um, Microsoft, which is a, a tech company that has ESG targets that they want to meet. They purchase removals from um, a facility called Orsted in Denmark, which is waste to energy with um, carbon capture um, and are, um, are using that to meet their ESG targets. And so just gives you an example of how, um, how carbon removals can work on the market. Next one. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but I just wanted to give a high level overview of how this would actually work and kind of where the different places of innovation exist. So in the forestry pulp mill example, um, the forestry company will secure biogenic feedstock. Um, so that could be through the slash piles that I mentioned earlier, um, could be a number of different ways. It's really important that this is done in a sustainable way. So in Canada, we have sustainable forestry practices 
that's not necessarily true worldwide. Um, so that's a really critical part where we need to be doing that in a way that sustainably regenerates the forest, but also can help mitigate things like wildfires or, or avoid um, you know, just burning, burning piles of waste without diverting it to electricity. So that's the first part. Um, the first com the forest company will could use that to produce um, to, you know, obviously they'll be producing pulp and paper products um, you know, that we all use, but they'll also produce electricity with that. Um, to power their facility and export to the grid. Um, that flue gas um, can then be sent to a separate carbon capture facility, um, which will, they'll take that flue gas and that flue gas that has 10, 20% CO2 in it, and they'll concentrate it so it's pipeline grade, so like 99.9% .9 CO2. It'll go into a dedicated CO2 pipeline and then could be, um, most likely would be sequestered underground in a location that has uh, a poor space underground that is um, that is uh, able to take that in a safe way and be monitored safely. Um, and then there's this other piece that has to happen um, that it, um, the, the, the fact that the removal has occurred has to be verified and recognized transparently against a recognized international standard. And this is an area that's um, still emerging and there's actually been companies that have um, gotten into trouble in the past for investing in removals that weren't um, verified against international standards in kind of a transparent way. So this is another, another kind of area where there's opportunities for, um, for innovation and also um, just necessary to have, have, um, have accepted standards to make sure that this is occurring and that this isn't just you know, saying we did this. We actually know that the removal has occurred. We know that that ton of CO2 is permanently taken out of the carbon cycle. Um, and then finally, a company such as Microsoft, but it could be a number of, you know, any company that is interested in removals. Um, the other day I was, I was renting a car and I actually had the opportunity to add an offset to my car rental. So maybe Enterprise is doing that as well. I'm not sure. Um, but they would look for a removal that's verified against a standard that they can, um, they can use to back up, back up their targets that they are therefore able to claim as an emissions reduction. Next slide. Um, and just in the last couple of slides here, I just wanted to comment on how um, there's kind of uh, how emissions reduction Alberta has invested in the forestry sector to help tee this up. Um, it's not just about carbon capture, but it's about um, sustainable forestry and a lot more than that. So I'll just run through a couple of, of brief project slides um, that show how you can end up with a BEX project at a pulp mill. Um, next one. Uh, so this is a project that we funded recently um, with the Mercer Peace River pulp mill. Uh, this is a fiber procurement project. So previously, um, Mercer used to um, uh, harvest trees in the forest, and then they would um, debark and cut the branches off in the forest, um, and then take just the part they needed back to the mill. This project allowed them to build a new wood room, um, and that wood room allows them to bring the whole tree back to the mill um, and then do the debarking and the debranching there. And then that bark and those branches can then be used um, to produce electricity instead of being left in the forest. Um, of course, that list, this requires a lot of forestry experts to manage you know, how that's all done, how that forestry ecosystem is being maintained. But this is an example of a project that um, has allowed kind of new, uh, new uh, biogenic feedstock to be, um, to be added to um, producing electricity. Um, next slide. Um, here's another example. Um, this is a project that we supported with Alpac in which they installed a waste heat recovery system. Um, so the waste heat recovery system allowed them to free up steam, which will allow them to generate additional electricity. Um, so if you were to combine this um, with, for example, you know, the project I just mentioned, you'd get more feedstock and then you get more steam, more electricity. Um, and then in the future, you could look at kind of the next step of, of actually installing carbon capture and you would have maximized both your electricity production and your removals. And go to the next slide. And yeah, so finally, um, we are seeing some emerging um, opportunities for BECs in Alberta and across Canada. So this is an example of a feed study that we funded um, at the Hinton Mill where they are looking at installing um, installing carbon capture and storage onto the pulp mill to, um, and then to generate removals that they would sell around the world. So this is just the last thing I want to leave you with is that um, uh, we think that BEX is potentially a very exciting opportunity for um, Alberta, but also in Canada um, for a number of reasons, but um, some of them are listed here. You know, we have a robust forestry industry that is sustainably managed um, compared to elsewhere in the world. We know how to manage our forests. 
Um, and then we do have um, a lot of experience in Canada with carbon capture and storage to do that well. Um, in Alberta and other parts of Canada, there are there's access to pore space to sequester that CO2 underground. Um, and then we also have the frameworks to enable um, uh, biogenic electricity production to be added to the grid as a clean source of electricity at the same time that we're generating those removals. And um, that's it. I think we have a few minutes for questions now. Thanks, Grace. Uh, that was great. We're actually going to jump into Jerry and Daniel's uh, portion, and then we'll great. have a little Q&A after. Okay. So with that, as I just alluded to, we're going to jump to our panelists. So these are two of our Carbonext um, and Foresight Generally innovators who are working in the Spex landscape. We have Jerry Christian, who's the CEO and co-founder of New Life Green Tech, and we have Daniel Ronald, who is the co-founder and CEO of Infinite Carbon. I'm initially going to pass it over to Jerry to talk about New Life Green Tech. Good morning. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Before I just get into talking about what uh, New Life is and what we do, I'd like to just give a little background to it because we come at it from a little different angle. Um, my co-founder and I were both seasoned entrepreneurs. I spent 19 years uh, starting and building my restaurant chain and vertically integrated, et cetera. But I always saw through that process waste. And the waste that we created, the waste that we threw out, I always thought there's, there's value there. And so I just carried that. When I sold uh, my business, Brock had sold his about a year and a half before me, and we knew each other quite well. We wanted to do something together. And we were trying to figure out, what do we do? Where do we see opportunity? And looking forward, we saw that waste, or green tech, as it was called back then. We thought you know, that, that was a good thing to go going forward. But a big driver of it was his daughter was six months younger than my youngest son, and they were in daycare together. So we're looking at this, we have this wonderful opportunity of, of looking to start a business. And what can we do? What is our big driver? Well, we need to do something to make this place better for our kids because it's not their mess or it shouldn't be their mess. But we knew that if we can make um, a business profitable, we can maximize our impact because we can use the leverage of the profit motive to drive expansion. So that I just want to touch off is, is a big driver to start of, of new life. Uh, behind it. So next slide, please. Every day, we all create way too much waste. And New Life's goal is to transform these environmental liabilities into carbon negative assets. So enormous amount of waste is generated in the United States alone. And the big challenge is the current methods, again, are expensive, inefficient, and restricted. We're seeing that landfilling bans of organics, land spreading bans because of PFAS crisis. Um, you know, wastewater treatment plants and anaerobic digesters concentrate those contaminants, such as PFAS or forever chemicals, which till now have been spread on the land. And that's a big problem. All right, next slide, please. What do we do? Well, we are tackling that wet waste disposal problem. So through our patented hydrothermal liquefaction technology, we transform like food, dairy processing, and sewage sludge into sustainable bio. We'll start off by using that for carbon removal to generate CDRs, but our oil also has the option of being upgraded into renewable fuels, okay? I just want to, because I want to describe a, a little bit more, a little more specifically, technically, what we do. So our process is a thermochemical process. It breaks down and liquefies high moisture organic materials. It's an exothermic reaction, and it occurs under high pressure approximately over just over 3000 PSI and temperatures in the range of 300 to 350 degrees C. It uses water as a catalyst to reform the organic materials into long train hydrocarb hydrocarbons of sustainable bio oil. And the output phases are include biochar, a water phase and a gas phase, which is 99% biogenic CO2 with no detectable methane. We're actually not going to be store sending that for storage because we're not near a pipeline but we plan on um, cleaning it, capturing it, and bottling it to sell it for carbon neutral CO2, uh, hopefully into the uh, uh, brewery space. So big driver for us, again, we're a business, we're, a, you know, what's the benefit to the client is focusing on that. What, what is the value? Why should the waste generator care? And we ask them for no additional cost or CapEx. Um, we know that money is tight. We don't, we want to save the money right from the beginning. 
or we can quantify our emissions reduction and when in the right scenarios or in certain situations, we can help address their PFAS contamination. Next slide, please. So where are we at? That's what people care about. We've built our first processor. It's a commercial size processor. It's 60 feet long. Um, we'll be, actually we're adding a second one in September, and then we will build that out to a module, a commercial module being 12 of them. Our big driver is modular and scalable design. Um, and we're seeing, we're pro projecting over almost 14,000 tons of CO2 uh, reduction per module. Again, we make that bio oil. Our whole, again, model is to co-locate, take our equipment to the waste generator. Okay, It's not efficient to haul waste. Waste is being created every day. Let's solve that problem. And again, you know, uh, we've seen 90% PFAS removal. Uh, we're currently processing food and dairy waste. We have um, a dairy sending us material in, in a flour mill. So uh, those are our current clients. Maybe the next slide, please. Again, this is this is our specific market: food processing, sewage sludge. Um, it's enormous. Like focus on our market. Just five percent market capture, we can have significant impact. Next slide, please. So where are we at? Well, GFL, they're supplying this material. They pay us to take it. Um, we've got a dairy, we've got food processor. We're, like I said earlier, currently expanding because uh, um, uh, Saputo and Art Mills is sending us material. The big one is there's need and there's desire. So we're seeing that locally. We're working with wastewater treatment plants in New York State. They're land in one plant alone is landfilling 100,000 tons of sewage sludge a year. It just seems wrong on so many levels. Um, on the CDR side, you know, our LCA, we're, we're projecting 2.2 tons of CO2 emissions reduction per ton of bio oil. That's excellent. We are in due diligence uh, with CDR purchasers. So next step, your next slide, sorry, our business model. So our current, Again, we want to fit within the value chain. We're not asking people to change what they're doing. These waste streams are already being transported. We divert that. Um, they're already paying money to get rid of it. We want to save the money off the, uh, right from the start. Often it's uh, uh, a reduction in the transportation costs. So I described what the HCL process is. Again, what comes out, that sustainable bio oil. And in certain feedstocks, we have a biochar. So that'll be going for CDR credits. The water, if it's a dry feedstock, we can reuse the water. If it's a wet feedstock, we're in a generator of water, we clean it so it can be safely disposed of. And the gases I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be pilot testing equipment for our biogenic CO2. Um, next slide, please. So what have we done? This is always a fun, fun part to talk about because Foresight has been huge help for us. Um, I always have a big shout out to them. So we're generating revenue. You know, we're working on the feedstock supply. For the people in this space, you know, it's always a chicken and egg um, and you just have to keep moving it along. And that's what we've been doing. So an exciting part for us, we've also sent our bio oil to a U major US refinery. They got back to us a couple of days ago. They want to do additional work and they're looking into uh, the US EPA pathway for our for using our oil. So that's really exciting. Uh, a US heating oil association is using it also as a um, industrial heating oil to uh, replace fossil-based heating oil. Big desire in that space and two more US refineries. So we're we're using the CDR or we're, we're you know working with the CDR space, but also we take into account what is the best goal or or impact for society. Is it all of our product going to CDRs? Is it some of it, maybe the biochar going for CDRs and our bio oil substituting fossil base? And you know, what are we doing this year? We're just continuing to grow. Next slide, please. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Jerry. That was a great overview of what you guys are doing over there, which is phenomenal. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Daniel Ronald, who is the co-founder and CEO of Infinite Carbon Corporation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I just kind of wanted to uh, 
give you a little bit more of a backstory on obviously how I ended up into the carbon market and carbon technology. So just similar story. I had a bit of a winding journey into this. I'm actually um, was I'm a member of the Alberta Métis Nation. My dad was a park ranger. So I was born in Banff National Park and kind of grew up in the park systems all west of Calgary here, hunting and fishing. Um, that was just sort of a a different way for us to come into the sustainability and, and management side of things, you know, having a, a conservation officer as a father who's also an Indigenous person. But uh, I sort of got into university and was working through, um, I originally studied law and was kind of moving along that pathway until I had decided that I wanted to open up my own company after uh, law school or after, um, sorry, university. I was I put law school on the back burner and I started placing concrete after and uh, was working for inland concrete in Calgary, placing cement by the cubic meter, which was uh, at the time incredibly profitable, but it's super hard work. So I ended up expanding that and was working on that, but I just really wasn't enjoying it. So in 2008, I decided I was going to sort of downshift that and do some traveling with one of my friends. I'll go to the next slide. So at that point, I was actually super fortunate. I was able to have the opportunity to travel from above the Arctic Circle in none of it in Canada, all the way down to South America. You can see on the left side, I was went to Peru and down through the other. You can go to the next slide. I went through Peru and down into the Amazon, spent some time there. <clears throat> and then kind of one of the biggest things that I noticed, like everywhere we went, like I paid fairly good money to get myself way into the back corners of spots where I thought that nobody had gone and or would go in as far as the Arctic and the Amazon. And everywhere I went, there was just this huge amount of environmental destruction. Um, our human footprint was just sort of massive. Um, the next slide, please. So when I came back, I had actually um, decided that I wanted to get into sustainable development and shut down my concrete company. I had started working with a doctor, Nick Savadov. Um, we were actually designing and building vertical growing systems for organic hydroponics. And we're using carbon to filter the fish waste out of uh, aquaponic systems where you use fish farming to generate the nutrients for organic hydroponics. And was working with Dr. Savadov and the Lethbridge College and a group of doctors. And I was standing around in a room with this bag of carbon uh, with several other PhDs. And it was doctor, 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 Dan, you know, thanks for getting us all together here. So I was standing beside this carbon material and they were explaining to me like that this stuff uh, was with bamboo biochar, wasn't used in, you know, amazing studies to do filtration work. And they had also set up a bunch of work doing um, carbon soilless growing medium studies. And at the time I was using the vertical growing stuff and we were growing in rock wool. So I just said to them, you know, if this is the most amazing growing medium in the world, how come nobody like commercially is growing in it? And they said, well, at the time you have to adjust the pH to make it useful. So um that kind of founded an idea and I started a company called Peer Life Carbon. We actually were able to raise uh, $22 million and built a 17,000 square foot processing facility in Red Deer, Alberta and um, brought to market a new carbon product. So that's kind of how I got into the carbon products market it was a roundabout way through just green technology and a desire to do better for this whole world. Um, during that whole journey as well, I had planted trees in my first year of university and noticed that uh, just one of the shocking ways that we have when you cut down, you know, I'd, a thousand year old tree, you'd look and there'd be 30% of it left on the cut block as far as the wood stumps and branches and all the residuals. And then when you move that off the cut block and into the like milling process, you can also lose an additional 20%. So I was just looking for opportunities um, and there's an opportunity to take this material that I had noticed was out in the bush laying around and turn it into a high value carbon material. So we were, my partner and I, Paul Horton, were looking for opportunities when uh, he was introduced to 
well, he knows a bunch of connections into the steel world. So we were introduced to an opportunity to work with one of Canada's largest steel producers to actually take some of this material, do the conversion and try to find a carbon material to offset some of their green steel goals. So next slide. So we were working along trying to find a, um, a technology to do this. And we ended up partnering with uh, Dr. Franco Baruti out of the Western University. And we're starting to, he has a division called IC4, and we're starting to work with them to bring to market some of the uh, pyrolysis technology that they've been working on for years. Next slide. So kind of the three opportunities that we sort of realized there's this underutilized wood laying around in the Canadian forestry. The opportunity is there to gather it up. We had worked with Dr. Savadov to commercialize some of this material, this uh, technology and sorry, the pyrolysis phase. So we were able to license one of these reactors and we have the uh, market for this high quality renewable carbon. Next slide. So this equipment is kind of something that's novel. It's not a first of its kind. It's kind of a, a follow behind to a bunch of the other first movers to market, which is a nice safe place to be for investors. And it combines kind of two techniques that are used usually separately within the creation of these carbon materials. So you can see there's three separate chambers along this here. And what it does is it has the power to bring in this material and dis disperse the moisture and volatiles in it that are very quick, which is a process known as uh, fast pyrolysis. And then it has a long retention time. So what it does is actually bakes off all the remaining contaminants and organic compounds into a very high carbon uh, purity and driving off of any of the other ones of the impurity so that we can make this really, really high quality necessary that's required for get, and getting, <clears throat> pardon me, gaining entry into uh, markets like metallurgical biocarbon. Next slide. So we got to work on the technology and we founded a team. I myself was the co-founder. I, um, I said, I have experience. I worked with uh, in entrepreneurs and founding uh, Pure Life Carbon. My co-founder's name is Paul Horton. He was the uh, co-founder of Certeris. They were a compressed natural gas trucking company that uh, was just sold to Superior Propane. They did a billion dollar exit. So he has uh, connections into the sustainable fuels market and logistics and engineering exp experience. And then um, another friend of mine is uh, Ryan Mullaney, who's our uh, co-founder as well and our VP of finance. Next slide, please. So what we've done so far is we founded the uh, Infinite Carbon Corporation we secured an MOU with a major steel manufacturer and we applied for some non-dilutive um, funding. I'm, as I said, Métis, so we were able to go through the Indigenous pathways into getting some funding from the Ontario government, which was able we were able to use to do all the bench work and feasibility studies with Dr. Uh, Franco Baruti, as we said. We collaborated with him to kind of finish off this technology and get it licensed. And we've uh, identified and secured a location. We have a forestry partner. Right now, we're focused on the hardwood market. So um, we're looking at specifically the non-tolerant hardwoods like birch, poplar, and then there's some maple that we're also targeting. And then we are currently negotiating the uh, offtake agreements with their steel partner and raising seed capital to provide our pilot facility. So next slide. We've also assembled a uh, broader team of advisors to help make sure we keep this project on task. As I'd said, Dr. Franco Baruti was the uh, division leader at ICFAR for Western, which is basically the thermal conversions, one of the top thermal conversion specialists in the world. Um, and also notable is uh, Rick Groves, who's a forestry um, management consultant in Ontario and is his pulse, has measured the pulse of kind of the fiber supply on that side of things. So. We're good and uh, secured from advice on the uh, outside. And next slide, please. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we're just getting into the point where we're raising our seed rounds. So we've done a bunch of work with Foresight and I also wanted to give them a huge shout out. We went through the launch and deliver program and we've had just nothing but great experiences with the EIRs and guiding us through this here. So both my partner and I are experienced um, entrepreneurs, but it does not, 
heard whatsoever if there's anyone out there thinking about joining this program to have some of these people come in and help you guide yourself along through the process but uh in that there i, I thank you very much that's all i have to say as far as uh infinite carbon today thank you daniel and i swear i did not pay him to give us the plug there but i really <laughs> Um, so with that, we're going to jump into our Q&A portion of the panel. I saw a couple questions in the chat that Jerry answered, but maybe just for the recording, Jerry, can we go over them again? So for your feedstock, are there any pretreatments required before um, the hydrothermal liquefaction process? And then also, uh, do you use renewable energy um, to create the heat that is necessary? Um, renewable energy? So we're based in Saskatchewan, uh, which becomes a bit of a challenge because most of our Power is coal fired. We are able, though, we got a uh, through SAS Power, we got a bit of a special arrangement. We get to buy renewable electricity certificates. So we offset all of our power. Um, on the pre treatment side, we're somewhat selective on what we bring in. Um, but if we're food processing, uh, waste, dairy waste, it's very consistent and it becomes more of a screening and confirming particle size, there may be some particle size reduction and mixing slurification. So we get to engineer a slurry. So it's, you know, optimal slurry for us and uh, uh, the best yield. So we will be able to mix uh, feedstocks together, such as if it's a little too wet, we can add dry, such as add waste flour into the dairy material. When we get to other products, such as a sewage sludge, that will require some more pre-processing um, especially the mixing, but also the particle size, degrading, that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, Grace, I'm going to pass it over to you. So in your experience, are companies becoming less risk adverse as the CUS and the BEX industries continue to grow and evolve? Um, yeah, that's a really tricky question. Um, I don't know that they're becoming less risk adverse. I think like I think that, um, so we have some operating CCUS full-scale infrastructure in Alberta. For example, we have the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, that's a full um, CO2 pipeline. And then we have the Shell Quest project and a couple others. Um, and so now, um, you know, there's a lot of incentives in place to look at CO CCUS at large commercial scales more broadly. And so everyone is looking at it, but I think when you start looking at deploying that at scale, you start learning more about what that looks like at scale. And there's, um, you know, you learn more as so you learn more risk. So I don't know that, I think definitely we're in a place where um, it's an exciting time for CCUS and there's going to be a lot and will continue to be a lot of investment. But I, I think that um, we're also in a place where we're learning more about the challenges. <laughs> so um, a little bit of a mixed bag there. Yeah, yeah we're, we're kind of a little bit beyond first of its kind, but still kind of yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah so. like uh, like we definitely know how to build a commercial CCS project and what that looks like. But then, you know, I think we're still learning what it looks like to do that at, at scale with many projects at once. Yeah, yeah. so much great. Um, Daniel and Jerry, what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs that are thinking about joining the carbon space? Daniel, you want to go on this one first? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's one of those things that you want to like, think slowly about and move, you know, slowly into, I would advise getting some advice and, and, uh, but joining a program like Foresight always helps, but, uh, plug you guys again here. Thanks for the help. And, um, it's just something you got to make sure you're passionate about. It's not easy. I'm going to second that one. It's, uh, harder than you're going to, you think it's going to be, and it's going to take a lot longer. But just thinking about some of our experience, you know, even trying to, you get into it. That's great. You're excited. You know the technology. Simplify your story because your crowd, let it be investors, uh, families and friends, angels, frankly, the majority of VCs, they do not understand the CDR space as, or especially your technology, right? And so one of the things I go back to, you know, in the Foresight program, um, Jeff Reading, he kept hammering us product market fit and pick up the phone. Do people actually care? Do they want your solution? Will they pay for your solution? Or are you just creating something that's cool, right? That value proposition. So we never wanted to be a research project. My, my co-founder and I were business people. That's what we're doing. We're, we're always trying to simplify it, use proven uh, equipment, not trying to design our own. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question from the audience. So. For all the speakers, 
How important are CDR credits to the deployment and scale up of CDR? I assume this means pre-purchase um, and offtake agreements. I'll answer that one first. To me, you know, in the CDR space, the goal is we're going to pay high and then we want to see as the technology develops and, and becomes commercialized, we want to see that price drop. Fabulous. At least they get it. It costs more at the beginning. If you can't, you know, reduce your price over time, that, that becomes a business problem. Uh, incredibly, incredibly important is in getting those pre-purchase because again, for us, we're, we're working with a CDR off-taker right now and there's uh, likely a pre-purchase component to it. That money becomes really incredibly valuable. Then you can also, we as a company can take that money and leverage it with different uh, non-dilutives or government-backed equity programs. So reducing that dilution. <clears throat> well, thanks. Um, yeah, go ahead. You go next. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> we're, we're open to... Uh, place those carbon credits on as a cherry on top of our business model. We're kind of basing it on a commodity type uh, business model for the, for the time being and, and looking for those opportunities to do the pre-sale on some of them. So I'm interested to hear more about how some of these other companies have pulled that off. So always willing to learn. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it really depends on the company and the technology, lots of dependencies. But for example, in the example I was talking about at a, at a pulp mill, a pulp mill is not like absent somebody being out there really interested in investing in CDRs. A pulp mill doesn't really have an incentive to deploy CCS because they don't really have an emissions problem if they're, if they're using biogenic electricity. So they, they don't have the same, I guess, stick as other industries like oil and gas, where it's like you need to reduce um, so it's a different, it's a little bit of a different business model. So I think, um, yeah, having investment interest in CDRs is is important um, to, because a lot of these, some of the projects that we're talking about are very capital intensive and they're incremental. Um, and that's kind of what's driving the business. Thank you all. Um, Grace, I'll have you. What are the biggest challenges from an industry perspective on deploying novel technologies? Um, I think there's many challenges, um, but maybe the way I'll answer it is from ERA's perspective. So we're kind of funding that last stage of commercialization. Um, and what we find is that we're funding a lot of really exciting things that they work and there's industry interest, but sometimes in that final stage of commercialization is where you face your biggest challenges. Um, so it just like, you know, c commissioning or um, implementing it in a way that doesn't disrupt your, if it's a retrofit, your, your existing commercial business and integrating with your existing operations. So there's a lot of kind of surprising challenges and innovation on the margins that happens. And so that's why I think um, agencies like ERA that can give patient capital is really valuable um, because it, capital is a problem and it just, it just, it, they rarely, the, it, there's always challenges at that final stage that causes delays. And so I think, um, I think it's important to have patient capital to kind of get, get you through that phase. So you can commercialize. Okay. This is definitely something we try to highlight within the Carbon X program that you're trying to sell a solution and not a widget. And you're really trying to make your technology fit within the existing process and not, not causing a, mm -hmm. a, a huge um, redesign or anything like that. So, and I think Jerry and Daniel definitely get that and, and have shown how their solution is a one for one swap or solves a major problem. Um, so Daniel and Jerry, I would say, what are some of the major challenges that you've encountered that are specific to the Bex vertical? Just for me personally on this one, it's been a little bit more difficult to raise funds. I don't know sure if it's the timing or the technology, but um, yeah, on the last go rounds, we've had just more success raising funds. So this idea has been a little bit trickier. Challenges, wow. Uh... You know, so much of it always revolves around money, especially on a private, because people talk about, you know, the, these, these large CapEx uh, projects. We take a different view at it, on it. We are constantly trying to drive our CapEx as low as possible. And we've actually, um, to this point, we have no venture capital money We on our cap table. We have, you know, large angels and, and support from uh, government arms and, and strategics. So that's, that's been huge, but that access to capital, um, the programs that are in place, 
please keep them. We, we need them. Um, the other really challenging one is, you know, we re so this caused us to delay. People, let's go back. We started New Life in 2016, and we thought there was a waste problem then. And so we're working on, okay, we're making an oil. And refineries would say to us, hey, that's great. We love what you're doing. Keep it up. But we're not really going to engage because we're not forced to do anything right now. Well, that's really tough to, to, to go forward on. And getting that, now that's changing. But sadly, um, I think I mentioned, I may have mentioned, you know, we've sent oil to one U.S. refinery. And they've just come back this week saying, we want to do more testing. And we're looking at the U.S. EPA pathway. That's fabulous. The U.S. Industrial Heating Oil Association. We have two more U.S. refineries that are reviewing specs. And they think it looks like they'll want the oil. But the Canadian ones, they are too risk averse. Well, you go scale it up, use the U.S. ones, and then we'll step in. And that, so one of the biggest challenges I see is this Canadian conservatism and, and, and this risk aversion. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, definitely, this is such a new-ish um, area in space that it is really hard to move around a lot of the regulations and policies that are in place that are not flexible enough to support innovation. It's definitely something we hear from innovators across all of the different verticals of CCUS. Um, another question for Daniel and Jerry. So we've we've talked a lot about the challenges um, the difficulties you've had as you're getting this business to, to the places that they are. What keeps you motivated to continue persevering through this tech development journey journey and and developing these technologies? We know entrepreneurship's never the easiest path. So it's always interesting to me to hear why that's the path you chose. Um, sometimes I think it's just habit to keep going forward. <laughs> but um there's you know, uh, Jared kind of alluded to this too. It's like you 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 want to make a difference. That's why you end up in this kind of field. Is like there's that big shining goal of actually making, you know, a significant change in the world that makes improves it for future generations. I mean, if that's not really what's driving you forward and it's cash and fame, I think you're probably in the wrong space. But my advice would be, yeah, if you're you're genuine about making a big difference and you can have the motivation to keep forward and develop the good habits to keep going when times are terrible, then those are the things that you can do. I think Daniel nailed it, right? It, 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 this comes from in, in internal. Uh, no one, you know, again, people say, love what you're doing, but we're not going to do anything right now to support you. And that, that, that It takes that internal drive to keep going. You're doing the right thing, right? You're solving you're solving challenges. Um, now, as we're you know, gaining more traction, and let's be honest, the last couple of years, the winds are now blowing at our back. And it's, it's, it's you know, we're, we're advancing much quicker. And it's great. Those little comments, even from shareholders, you know, I love, um, we do an annual, we invite all our shareholders in to come and see what we've done. See how we've spent your money. And they're excited. And they, they want to stay engaged. And when they even call, for, you know, for an update and it's fun to rattle off them, that achievements uh, slide we showed. And they, they get excited. They're like, oh my God, keep it up. Maybe I have someone I want to introduce you to. And those little things, you know, you have to take, you have to take um, what delight and drive from. Thank you. Um, Grace, maybe I'll flip the question to you. What keeps you motivated to continue working in the spec space, kind of from the industry or the supportive industry perspective? Um, I do have a huge, tremendous respect for innovators and people who, you know, dedicate their lives and take all that risk. Um, you know, I'm sitting from the other angle of helping kind of to allocate the funds, but I just think um, I'm just amazed by how many exciting ideas there are out there. Like every time you think, oh, we know that the answer here, it's solved. Somebody else comes up with some crazy new idea that you're like, actually, that's really cool. So um, I think it's really important to, you know, keep your mind open. And I just, I just love being able to, um, to help advance that and, and just, um, help make sure that I guess the funds go toward the best ideas and um, and make these projects happen. Thank you. We definitely need industry support. So I'm sure I can speak for Daniel and Jerry on this on um, this front to support their work and support their uh, project deployment and things like that. So we're really grateful for the work that ERA does in that space. Um, we're in our last couple of minutes, so maybe I'll just open it up to the floor. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you really want to share with our audience today? Uh, 
I'm I'm good. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is wonderful. I just want to say thank you for for the opportunity to sh not only share our stories but just engage. Um, thanks, Daniel and Jerry, for your presentation. That was that was great. Yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna hop on put up the last slide here. So thank you everyone for coming today. We're grateful for your um, attendance and participation in the chat and the great conversation that we had today. Um, we will be back next month and we're still working on what vertical that's gonna be, but it should be announced late, very shortly. So stay tuned in the follow-up email. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to our events team um, after the session, we'll be happy to respond to you. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Thank you everybody.